You hate nuclear waste? So do I. These reactors can eat nuclear waste. Take some of the waste that's already been created in our uranium fueled reactors and potentially destroy those long-lived transuranics through fission. You know, waiting them out to decay is a very slow process. We hate nuclear waste too, but what we really hate is we hate wasting it. For all Helen Caldicott's concern about our current stockpile of partially spent fuel, she offers no solution on what to do with it. So the only way to prevent being exposed to radiation is to close down all the nuclear reactors in the world and to get into renewable energy. Then you're still stuck with the radioactive waste, which is the legacy we leave to our descendants, which is really criminal. Unspent nuclear fuel is a Helen Caldicott problem, not an engineering problem. Already existing nuclear waste is its own independent addressable issue. An issue which hasn't been addressed yet, only because people like Helen Caldicott They don't know what's out there. They don't know. Block every attempt to improve storage of these stockpiles. Similarly, reactors that consume nuclear waste as fuel ought to have some sort of appeal. So the thing that's been a problem from those reactors is actually what gets fed into ours, and you're reducing the volume of the waste quite dramatically as you're going through this process. Making it cease to exist and making carbon-free energy with it in the process, wouldn't that be a slightly better deal than burying it? May you, would you please consider that as an option? Think of all the different car models we have on the road. That's how many different ways there are to design a nuclear reactor. Not a single one has been cited by anti-nuclear organizations as worthy of development. Today's reactors are mostly a category called pressurized water reactors. They can't consume partially spent fuel rods. They don't use molten salt. They've been producing carbon-free electricity for us since 1958. In a way, pressurized water reactors are pretty boring. The Westinghouse AP1000 is the very latest pressurized water reactor. No AP1000 is operating yet, but eight are under construction. AP1000 are made of prefabricated parts, allowing on-site assembly rather than on-site construction. AP1000 also incorporates passive safety features never before seen in a nuclear reactor, any one of which would have prevented the meltdown at Fukushima. Here, Helen Caldicott is asked about the future of nuclear power. She has not been specifically asked about the AP-1000. She feels obliged to bring it up herself. Generation 3 reactors, which are what they're building now in southern South Georgia, which is um, uh, an AP-1000, which is still a light water reactor like the ones you have here, but it's cheaper because it's got less steel and less concrete in it, and it's called an eggshell reactor. <laughs> in the industry, so it could easily have an accident. It's very dangerous. What was that last thing again? And it's called an eggshell reactor. <laughs> in the industry... Can you believe that? No. An eggshell reactor is not what the industry calls the AP-1000. That's like the solar industry referring to concentrated thermal as a Kentucky Fried Chicken Tower. Or the wind power industry calling their latest windmill a bird blender. It is true that the AP-1000 uses less steel and concrete. In fact, it uses fewer pumps, valves, and control cables too. It is a more compact reactor and it takes advantage of passive safety over engineered safety wherever possible. AP-1000 was approved by the NRC in 2005. Prior to the AP-1000, the last reactor certified by NRC was in 1978. This is a 1978 computer. This is a 1978 car. Have we learned nothing at all in 27 years about reactor safety, about constructing stronger buildings with less material thanks to modern composites? The lower cost of AP1000 is primarily due to factory construction and on-site assembly, not by sheer volume of parts or concrete. These AP-1000 could survive a direct hit from a hijacked commercial airplane. Understanding the safety improvements found in the AP-1000 is like studying the basket weaving 101 of nuclear power. The improvements are 27 years worth of common sense. 
loss of off-site power at the same time the standby diesel generators fail to start, resulting in a station blackout. Outside of the containment vessel, cooler air passes over the steel as the steam is condensing to water on the steel walls inside of the containment vessel, the decay heat is transferred from the steam to the steel. How can anyone who's dedicated her entire life to studying all things nuclear not know exactly what an AP-1000 is and where the cost savings are coming from? Uh, an AP-1000, which is still a light water reactor like the ones you have here, but it's cheaper because it's got less steel and less concrete in it, and it's called an eggshell reactor <laughs> in the industry, so it could easily have an accident. It's very dangerous. If nuclear power were clean, safe, economic, and assured of ample fuel, and socially benign per se, it would still be unattractive because of the political implications of the kind of energy economy it would lock us into. That's Amory Lovins, the man who persuaded a generation of environmental leaders that you could power modern human civilization on energy coming from wind and solar. You know, an amazing proposition. Uh, you know, I've worked for major oil companies for about 35 years. Dr. Gordon Edwards, recipient of the Nuclear Free Future Award, it may be that one day, after all the power reactors have been shut down and folks have weaned themselves off nuclear power, some version of a molten salt reactor may be useful for waste management purposes. But not now. To do it now would just be unleashing the dogs of nuclear expansionism. Greenpeace Conference Strategy Notes Close nuclear power down by halting development of new disposal facilities. Reject efforts to negotiate an agreement for citing the repository. Continue to stall until Congress gives up on the repository program. You would think any organization constantly warning us about radiation from nuclear waste would want to see it moved to and monitored in an underground geological repository. You would think anyone considering the use of molten salt reactors to help dispose of nuclear waste would simultaneously use them to generate electricity since the unavoidable side effect is the release of massive amounts of energy. You would think anyone concerned about global warming would be keen to deploy any energy solution that was clean, safe, economic, and sustainable. And you would think Dr. Helen Caldicott would know an AP-1000 from a hole in the ground. If their goal was safe nuclear power, yes. But their goal is the elimination of nuclear power. We have to have humility and understand who we are, and then we're not. We're not God. We're, we're just fallible human beings who make mistakes, and therefore we must eradicate all things nuclear. Improvements to safety, less expensive reactors, and nuclear waste repositories make nuclear power more attractive. Therefore, safe reactors and relocation of fuel rods must always be fought no matter how reasonable the proposal is. No dose is safe. You never need your teeth x-rayed, except if you've got an abscess. Don't get your breasts x-rayed every two years. No, they don't understand how radiation causes cancer. They don't know that each dose they receive causes cancer. They have pictures of fetal defects and deformed babies and all the rest. I mean, make it come home. Perhaps the most unintended consequence achieved by such fear-mongering is the hobbling of the very renewable technologies Caldicott insists we switch to. There's a critical role for wind and solar to play in the fight against poverty and climate change. This is because some of the costs of operating a nuclear reactor remain fixed. No matter how little electricity is required from it, you still need security and well-trained operators on site 24-7. Gigawatt nuclear reactors are well suited to powering large cities. About half the world's population does not live in cities. You see the 7 billion people up there? The air people, the wash people, the bulb people and the fire people. In the poorest nations outside of cities, there's no access to electricity at all. So even a few watts per person can make a huge improvement to their quality of life and chance for prosperity. Solar and wind can scale down much further than nuclear can to meet basic human needs. The need for electricity, the need for light. Imagine only being able to work or read in the evening by burning something. Well, 
Mozart and, and Shakespeare wrote by candlelight. Ooh, candlelight. I'm writing an article for the International Herald Tribune now about the future of nuclear power, and I ended it by saying that and said, and they, the editor wrote back and said, well, you don't want to encourage people to think they have to go to candlelight again. The International Herald Tribune editor objected to her call for a return to candlelight. Well, what's wrong with candlelight? That's right. That's right. Did she actually ask the editor that question? Does she ever ask questions? Not hypothetically of the audience, but actually ask questions exploring how she might be wrong. Burning a candle produces more heat than light. Even an old incandescent nightlight bulb, powered by a coal plant, emits far less CO2 than burning a candle, to say nothing of fluorescence or modern LED lighting. Don't forget Mozart wrote by candlelight. 200 years ago there were 1 billion people, and now there are 7 billion. Helen, this is basket weaving 101 of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. You stop burning carbon. Photovoltaic solar, plus a battery, plus light emitting diodes, solve this problem quite nicely, and they can scale from handheld to street lights. Similarly, off the grid energy needs in America are being met by renewables. As a community or outpost's needs grow past what can be inexpensively produced by renewables, energy can then be provided by a small modular reactor. But under 25 megawatts, a nuclear reactor is an inappropriate energy solution. There simply is no such thing as a thorium-powered car. So the world does have a need for renewables, and we'd all be better off if they were as inexpensive as possible. Everybody had their earphones in their ears while I've been talking to try to drown me out? There you go, thank you. Older folks like me will recall a day when Earphones didn't look like that. It was more like, like this. There were these big things that went over our ears. The whole trick to that has been the invention of a little magnet based on neodymium, neodymium iron boron magnets. Extremely powerful magnets, and they use a rare earth mineral called neodymium. One of the places they find application is in the generators that sit on top of windmills. Because if you're gonna put a generator on a windmill, on this really, really high stock, you want it to be as lightweight as possible. Now, why am I talking about neodymium? Well, I have a friend who's trying to start a rare earth mine in Missouri. Every known way to extract rare earths from their mineral concentrates, thorium just literally drops out like a rock and you have it. And all he wants is to just not have to treat the thorium as a nuclear waste. He's not saying, I'm not going to sell it yet. I'm just going to set it aside for future use. How much thorium do you think you'll be pulling up a year? I think about 5,000 tons. 5,000 tons of thorium would supply the planet with all of its energy for a year. The thorium is free. So it's going to be the most valuable commodity in the world with almost no value. And he goes, and there's like a zillion other places on Earth that are just like my mine. It's a nice mine, but it's not unique. It's not like this is the one place on Earth where this is found. Domestic content of major wind power components which one of these wind turbine components produce mildly radioactive thorium as a byproduct of their production? It's the most important slide you're going to see tonight. And that's what nobody knows. What really is in a nuclear reactor? We are still making the fission products. And a number of those I mentioned can be extracted usefully. By extracting the first four fission products, xenon, neodymium, zirconium, and molybdenum, right away you've reduced the waste stream considerably. Barium, lanthanium, cerium, presidium, ne neo, I can't pronounce that. Whether wind turbines are imported or constructed within the United States, the required neodymium for the magnets in their generators is imported. Even domestically mined rare earth deposits containing neodymium make a round trip to China where the thorium is separated and retained before the neodymium is shipped back to the United States. You mustn't leave your lights on. You've got to turn your lights off at, as, as you walk from room to room. Turn off your lights. And of course, we do efficiency. That is the foundation of everything. Uh, 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 turn them off. Efficient use of energy to produce light in fluorescent lights, compact fluorescent lights, and LEDs all take advantage of rare earth phosphorus to improve brightness and color balance of white light. There's a new uh, solar technique developed by a South African scientist that uses a micro 
thin metallic film which is five times more economical uh, and efficient than the present PV solar vo voltaic cells. Thin film solar voltaic contains indium. 95% of naturally occurring indium is mildly radioactive. Well, we don't have to stop driving cars. What we need to do is put solar panels on all the parking lots. Um, and so you have an electric car. Liquid metal hydride batteries contain lanthanum. In the early 1900s, with Henry Ford, the vehicle choice were all electric vehicles. And then uh, the gasoline engine and the internal combustion engine made, made that uh, uh, obsolete because of the economics. So we've all been looking for the next generation of batteries. And then when you move into an all electric vehicle, it weighs around 600 to 700 pounds, and also they're around 12 to 15 thousand dollars. Now this is 12 to 15 thousand dollars out of a 22 thousand dollar car. So you can see why the economics are are what they are. Mildly radioactive thorium is a byproduct of refining lanthanum, so we import it rather than processing it ourselves. If you had solar panels on every house and the whole area covered with windmills and geothermal and cogeneration, millions of jobs would be created a la FDR. The New Deal. This is the new, new deal. This is the new energy deal. Every time you build a windmill, you create jobs in China because they have the neodymium and dysprosium. And, and it's, it's also increasingly true for solar. Why aren't there solar panels on all the parking lots? So you buy your electric car from China, plug it in during the day, and it's a solar-powered car. You buy your electric car from China. So here we have a jobs program, but it's not jobs for Americans, it's jobs for somebody else. Money's all over the world. I don't even see how the economy works. I don't understand it. Jim Hendrick gave a talk, and he had just left the United States Geological Survey. Laid back fella, and very laconically, he's like, so these are the materials that we were uh, very reliant on back in 1985. And, um, and now those are the ones we're reliant on. And, to, and I was like, holy crap! Oh, I was like, are you kidding me? And he's, you know, and, and, uh, and he, he was like, oh yeah, we're, we're in a really bad way. Something called rare earth materials. They're used by American manufacturers to make high-tech products like advanced batteries that power everything from hybrid cars to cell phones. We want our companies building those products right here in America. But to do that, American manufacturers need to have access to rare earth materials, which China supplies. Our Congress has accepted that the rare earth issue is a national security issue. They recognize that it's an economic issue of, of massive proportions. So they get that. So what we also know is that thorium and rare earths are linked at the mineralogical level. And the U.S. will never be able to challenge China and build a value chain of rare earths until we solve the thorium problem. Thorium's uh, not dissolvable. You know, your body doesn't know what to do with it. It's not, you know, you can't, uh, uh, you know, utilize it in your body at all. It won't build up in your system. It goes right through you. You'd be interested to visit the exposure lab at the University of Cincinnati. Workers like that worked on the Manhattan Project will their bodies to them, and they 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 dissolve the bodies in uh, HF and and uh, other acids, and then they sift it out and see how much plutonium and uranium and stuff wound up in their bodies. Yeah, it's sort of like donating your body to science. So they've got really really good, very very long term exposure site. If you got a nice career long 40 year you know 10 20 million dollar year cleanup contract that never ends never ends you know you're gonna you know if you're you know fred's house of you know radiation remediation you're gonna be like it's dangerous it's dangerous you know so you got guys you know that have a very vested interest in keeping this you know as as scary as possible monazite is a common waste product those aren't rare earth mining companies. Those are mining companies that exist today, right now, that are throwing away five times what the United States needs in rare earths every year. They're throwing away every single year 40% of global rare earth consumption demand every year because of the thorium. Every single year, we could meet almost 50% of the world's needs in rare earths just from taking their trash 
going through their trash and pulling out the rare earths. And if you're wondering, you know, well, who could be against thorium? And who could be against rare earths? You know, they're so in love with this happy green idea and like, oh, we have the fluffiest bunny, we care the most. Well, it's not yeah. true. They're just silly. So every time you walk through a door that goes, psh, psh, it's either a carcinogenic door or a global warming door, which means your kids have no future. 